So today we, we move on. Uh, we have seen two, two ways. Well, really, the, the, I mean, we have seen different ways of, of solving this uh, Poisson Laplace equation. Uh, either by green functions or, I mean, uh, still by green functions, but uh, using the trick that you build uh, the green function by putting these uh, fake charges around outside the, the, the portion of space uh, you are interested in. Uh, and then uh, uh, also, although briefly, uh, in the case that you only have two dimensional problems that you can also exploit the fact that uh, Riemann uh, Cauchy conditions for uh, the ana analyticity of a function are indeed uh, the Laplace equation uh, in two dimensions. Okay, there are other ways of solving these, these equations but uh, we don't have time uh, and after all, I mean, you can find them if you are interested in the, in the textbook. But these are the main uh, uh, techniques uh, and the only one that is left is uh, uh, solving the equation in a way by brute force, right? I mean, we have this equation. Let's consider just the, the Laplace equation in which I put zero, so no charge. It's empty space. Uh, you want to find the potential satisfying Laplace equations with some boundary conditions, right? And of course, this is a, a highly non-trivial problem because this is a, it's a complicated differential equation. I mean, it's not the harmonic oscillator, it's, it's, it's complicated. It's, there are partial derivatives and uh, so how do you, so, but let's say I want to solve it nevertheless uh, uh, and you know from uh, something that we uh, did in classical mechanics that uh, you, your only chance to solve in a systematic manner this equation if it, it, it is if you can separate the problem, right? That is, that uh, your, so this is a, a, a function, right, in, in space, in three-dimensional space. So in Cartesian coordinates, let's start in Cartesian coordinates. Uh, it depends on x, y, and z. In general, you, you don't know, I mean, they mix it, I mean, it, it may be r rather complicated, but uh, if, 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 the if, if the solution separate in the product of, of uh, a function only of one coordinate and the other is uh, like this, right? If your solution can be factorized or separate, I mean, this is a separation of variables, you understand, because uh, uh, it's not the most general solution, but uh, let's assume that uh, because of the geometry of the problem, this is correct. You can try and solve this equation by separation of variables, because you understand that if you assume this, then this equation, what is this equation in, in, in Cartesian coordinates? So Cartesian. Well, is d2 dx square phi, right? Plus d2 dy square phi plus d2 dz square phi equal to zero. And you see that if I take my ansatz and I put it in, what I get is this, this set of and uh, uh, because you're assuming that this only depends on e x and this on y and z, the only solution is that you can have if this is equal to some constant, this is equal to another constant, and the sum of these two constants cancel out uh, the constant that this part must be equal to, right? Like the Jacobi-Hamilton equation. I mean, uh, is it, is, uh, this is a, a equation in the same class. It's a differential equation with partial derivatives, and so again, you can try and solve it by, so this technique uh, is called uh, separation of variables, I guess. is the last uh, technique that uh, we want to study and, and see. So as I said, that for this to be true, 
uh, this must be some constant. Let me put this equal to minus alpha square, this equal to minus beta square. So this function, I mean, this derivative must be equal to this constant. This differential equation must be equal to this. You see that in this case, really, this partial can be written as a total derivative. And the same here, right? Because it only depends on one variable, so it doesn't, the, the total derivative is the same thing. Then, uh, uh, and, that, and this one, you know how to solve it. And of course, the condition is that uh, if you call this gamma square, right, the condition is that the sum, right, uh, like this. So this is a constant, constant, constant. The sum of these constants gives you zero. Therefore, the sum of the square of alpha plus the square of beta, beta must be equal to that, right? So you see, okay, we are on, on our way to, to solve the problem because now the, it's much easier. I know the solution of this. In fact, these are exactly the same differential equation. And of course, you know the solution of that because it's just uh, our old friend, the exponential function, right? So I can write that uh, my solution phi of x, uh, y, and z must be the product, right? Because this is an exponential, this is an exponential, this is an exponential, uh, and uh, this is the exponential with alpha at the exponent, right? This, so I have my solution must be plus or minus, because uh, it doesn't matter, I alpha, right? And this is the part that, the part that uh, uh, only depends on x, times plus minus I, the beta uh, for the y dependent, times uh, uh, plus or minus. And you see, uh, this is, uh, because here I have the minus, so my, the solution is the complex uh, uh, phase. But here I have the plus sign, so this is a solution that uh, uh, it's, it's real. And also I know that gamma is the square root of the other two, so I can put this directly here, alpha square plus beta square z. So this is indeed the solution in Cartesian coordinates of, the, of my... Uh, Laplace equations, and, and the only thing that you don't know about this is uh, what these alpha and beta, beta are, right? Because I just took two constants, and clearly the values of this, of this alpha constant and this other constant must come from the boundary condition. Depending on the boundary condition that you uh, require for this equation, right, uh, uh, you will get a different value for this alpha and beta constant. So for instance, let's study the Laplace equation in this room. Right. What is? Why? No, yeah, we are studying the potential, not the electric field. Yes. Is there than the previous solution that explains potential? Yeah, okay, but uh, this, uh, there is a more interesting solution, I think. L let's see, just uh, bear with me. No, it, it's not zero. It's not otherwise, I mean, I wouldn't waste in your time to. No, I mean, it depends on the boundary conditions. It depends on the boundary conditions. Yeah. But uh, let's take a, like a, the Laplace equation in this room, uh, let's assume that this room is, is a square. Uh, it's, a, it's a cube, right? Something like this with the z, uh, I call y, and x. So it, it's, uh, it's uh, well, now I'm not very, right, so this, this is uh, the room. It's a cube, and we put the, the, the axis on one uh, edge of the cube, so it's a cube, uh, so I guess uh, this, this side here is A, A, and so on. So let's say we study this, 
with the boundary condition that the potential vanishes at the at the boundaries, right? Just uh, I mean, you can put a, a value, but that's so you see that. Uh, so my boundary condition is that my potential vanishes at the boundary. So uh, Uh, for instance, uh, at uh, so so you want it to vanish. Uh, well, x equal to a. No, okay. Let's let's make it a little more interesting. Uh, otherwise, let's put that uh, uh, it, it is uh, some value here. Let, let's study a, a more general case. So on top here, I put that is. Uh, some potential v, right? Uh, 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 that of course depends only on x and y, something like this. Mm? And on s instead, uh, I take it that vanishes on the other faces, like this, phi, phi equal to zero, where uh, uh, at x equal to a and y. So this is the this face here and y equal to a or b. We, we can take a cube or, or like this room that is not a cube. So this they can be equal. Let, let's keep it different so that it's even more. And also phi equal to 0 at the, at, at the origin. Mm. OK. Let's see if this is what I. I think uh, I want it to be zero. Now I forgot the, w the conditions I put, but I think, like, so it's it's zero here. So I x so I call it a uh, this right and b this. So it's a it's a box. So I put it equal to zero. Uh, x equal to a. Okay, so that means here, and and here. Okay, so this is this condition, and uh, now I forgot why, but let's do. I also put it equal to zero here at the origin. Well, I mean, I can pick the boundary condition I want. Now I forgot why a few weeks ago I decided this was interesting. But okay, so you understand. I I I, I fix these boundary conditions, and I want to find the general solution. Clearly, the boundaries conditions are going to impose conditions on these coefficients. It's a little bit like a Schrodinger equation, right? In fact, a Schrodinger equa equation is an example of, of a differential equation like this. So you see that uh, uh, for the potential to, to vanish uh, at uh, uh, x, y, and z equal <coughs> to zero, uh, I, I need to, to take a particular combination of this. And in fact, uh, I need that this alpha, first of all, they are sort of quantized, right? You understand? For instance, take this condition here. For, this, for the field to vanish on this, you need that the alpha, alpha times A, right? For instance, alpha times A, you want that to vanish. So you, you know that. Uh, uh, this has to be like a, a sign, a, and this function must be a multiple of pi divided by a, right? Similarly, to satisfy the other one, you get that the beta times b uh, uh, must be m pi divided by b. So you see, they, I mean, you can put a sort of an index here because only if they, 
you have alpha that must be this, uh, uh, sorry, like this. So as I said, alpha must be a multiple of pi divided by, uh, by, by A. Beta must be a, another multiple where N, M must be 1, 2, 3, or minus. And therefore, gamma itself, uh, uh, itself uh, must be, it depends on both these two integer number, M and N, and must be pi divided by the square root, uh, multiplied by the square root of N squared divided by A squared plus m squared divided by b squared, right? OK? And you see, uh, because of this condition, now I remember why I put this. Because then, uh, you see, as I said, you, you have to take I mean, here you can have various linear combination of the exponential, but if you want those combination to vanish in zero, you have to take the sign or the hyperbolic sign. A sign, if, uh, if you take this, uh, the hyperbolic sign. So in other words, in other words, uh, you can write now the, the, your solution uh, as a function of x, y, and z. It's going to be a product of a sign for this part here sine of what? Of this alpha n times x. Then uh, you have this part here that I have to take the combination that uh, vanishes there. So again, I have to take a sine beta m y. And then the combination that vanishes uh, uh, at z equal to 0, I have to take the hyperbolic, uh, uh, the sinh, the gamma m n z, right? And of these, I can take uh, any superposition uh, depending on n m with some coefficient that I'm going to determine, right? A and I can take any superposition of this with uh, uh, this number n and m that runs from 1 to any number. Okay? So this function by construction uh, satisfies the Laplace equations and also satisfies, as you can verify, the boundaries condition that I impose. So it's a solution of this uh, Laplace equation uh, with the given boundary conditions. As, as you can see, it's not a constant. It's a, it's a you know it's well you, you see what it is the function that uh, goes like a sine or an hyperbolic sine so it's it's a function like this No, but it's a finite, uh, we, are, we are inside this box. So this is the solution inside this box. I mean, Z uh, stops here. It's the solution inside that box because these are the boundary conditions. Okay? So it's not a Z, it that doesn't go to infinity. But, but I, I haven't finished. I mean, because uh, you see, this satisfies, but I still have to impose this condition here, right? Where you about what? Uh, no, they they are on the face. On this face, this face, this face, and this point. Uh, that that the boundary condition. So you are inside a certain volume. So, uh, I mean, we are inside the room, and uh, you are imposing some particular boundary condition on the on the walls. And the ceiling, and the and the and the ceiling, and the floor. So, uh, still, the ceiling boundary condition has to be uh, in, uh, uh, applied here, enforced in here. This is going to give a condition on this coefficient. Okay, you see, this is still general, but now, I mean, it satisfied those the boundary condition. I still have some 
some freedom, and this is uh, determined by the fact that uh, then my potential must assume this, this uh, arbitrary function of x and y on the on the top, and uh, so this is, is uh, how is this done? Uh, you just take z equal to c, right? You you go here, z equal to c, that is this side here, so a, b, and c. So you take that uh, phi, this function, is equal to v x y for z, z equal to c, so on the top side. I mean, a, b, c can be all equal to one other if you take a cube, or they are different if you... So, uh, so z equal to c, so that means that this is this sum here, right? and m equal 1 to infinity of sine alpha n x sine beta m y and here I put uh, I put this c so the sinh gamma m n c this must be equal to this function here and uh, I'm sorry and here you have the a I mean everything is determined except this uh, these coefficients. So uh, you use the usual trick. This is an infinite sum. Uh, I mean, so you can uh, sort of uh, uh, use uh, the integral, right? Replace the integral on the other side, and uh, uh, then uh, uh, the value of this uh, a. Uh, n uh, m uh, n n n uh, so you see if you multiply both sides by si sign uh, mm. by sine uh, alpha m and sine beta n, right, and then you integrate, I mean, they will give zero unless they hit uh, this uh, uh, number, so you integrate from zero to a, so you get, by normalizing, you get a, b. This one is just, uh, uh, nothing, it's just a constant now, right, because you put c, so you, you get the sinh of gamma m n c, and here you get the integral from, say, 0 and a in dx, the integral from 0 and b. You get this potential, v, x, y, and the sine of alpha, um, uh, alpha m x uh, sine beta n y integrated. We are already exploiting the fact that uh, these are sort of a, a complete set of, uh, of functions so that if you multiply by that, it will give zero unless uh, the number is, uh, is the same coefficient here. So if I give you this function, now this is always true. This fixes this coefficient in front of the general solution. And uh, if you then say this is equal to x plus y or whatever it is, then you do this integral and you get this coefficient and then you have the general solution. Okay. So you understand that you can solve many problems. Uh, already here is a class. So you can just, all the possible problems in which you vary the value you put on top and, and you just do this integral and you get the various solutions. Or you can change also the boundaries condition in a more complicated manner uh, and you will get the more complicated results. But rather than doing that, uh, let's uh, study uh, a more interesting, in a way, uh, 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 the same problem, but in spherical coordinates, right? Because uh, that, uh, for various reasons, is uh, more interesting, because we are going to use this uh, to define this multiple uh, pole expansion. So this was in Cartesian coordinates, but of course we can do the same we can do the same in, in spherical coordinates. Uh, uh, so clearly, 
you see here I put boundary conditions that were uh, nice and easy to, to exploit in Cartesian coordinates, meaning that I defined something. But uh, uh, so I didn't say the value of the potential on a sphere around something, because then you, you go crazy in, in, in solving this problem in Cartesian coordinates. But of course, in general, spherical coordinates are what you find more often in real, in, in real situations. So let's do that. Uh, and to do that, uh, we have to uh, study the Poisson equation in spherical coordinates. Yeah? No. I put a constant c when I, I I compute the function on the top on the ceiling, right? It's not a constant. It's a constant in z, but uh, still it's a function of x and y. No, c is whatever value you put. It's just a number that uh, you give me. I solve it for any C. Changing C doesn't change the solution. The solution was this one, right? Phi equal the sum over M, N, A, M, or N, M, I guess, N, M, sine alpha N, X, sine uh, uh, beta M, Y, sinh gamma M, N, Z, right? This is a general solution, but uh, still you don't know these coefficients. I f because I use sort of these two sides, but not the top side. Now, if I want this function to take that special value as z, so I want that phi for z equal to, I don't know, c is equal to a certain function v of x and y, then I fix these coefficients as I show you. Is that the question or? Well, that uh, is, is a hyperbolic sign in the z direction. It's a product of these three functions. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. This is a product of these three functions. I'm not sure I even see this function. It's complicated. But uh, along the fixed values of the other, this is like a sign. So it's like this. The other is like a sign. And the other is a hyperbolic function. Right? But uh, you see, it's a superposition of, of an infinite number of these sign and, and hyperbolic sign. And the weight of each of these so the weight of the one where alpha n is equal to pi over a, the one that uh, sine is 2 pi over a, you know, this depends on the value you want to the function to assume there. So by imposing that, I fix the relative weight of all these combinations. It's like the Fourier transform. I mean, uh, in fact, it, it, it's essentially, a, you know, a similar to the Fourier transform. You have a, a function represented by the, the infinite sum of elementary function and the weight of each of these elementary functions in the total function defines which which is the function that you are describing so let's do the same in spherical coordinates so first i need the laplace equation in spherical coordinates that is uh, one of the things you can find in those uh, uh, pages i handed out so we define this uh, spherical coordinate, usual way, say x, y, and z. So I take a point, I call theta the angle with respect to the uh, uh, orthogonal, I mean the vertical direction. I call r the distance from a certain, uh, and then I bring down this, and this angle here is phi, okay? So I have theta, r, and phi. And uh, in this coordinate, the Laplace equation is 1 over r, d2 dr square of r phi, 
plus 1 over r square sine theta. Uh, is that right? Or is r sine? Check on those. Uh, <laughs> I forgot. Uh, Yeah, okay. So. Um, d, d theta of sine theta d phi uh, d theta plus 1 over now the square of the sine d2 phi d phi square theta equal to 0. Do you recognize this equation? So, hmm? it's a R square. For no, but he has written. You see, I took yeah, it. Uh, but it I think it's uh, okay like this, right? Because uh, it's okay also like this, because the, then phi. So I, I call, again, I have to assume that it factorizes, that you can separate the variable. So I take u over r. So this is u. P theta q phi. So let's assume again that you, that you can separate uh, your variables. And uh, let's take this form. And you see that uh, uh, then you plug in here, let's see, uh, and then you see that, uh, first of all, the uh, 1, so maybe let's put it here, 1 over q. So you multiply, you, 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 you try this solution, then you divide by this. So the, this term here, you, you must have that uh, 1 over bq, that is the function depending on phi, d do, d two, so this term here, q, divide by d phi square, this again must be a constant, and uh, uh, in particular, uh, let's call it minus m square, like before, it was alpha. Okay? Then uh, if you, uh, uh, if you, if this is true, if this is true, then the remaining function, uh, angular function p, must satisfy uh, so I, let's see if it's true, this, this equation here. So you take this part here, sine of theta uh, d, uh, dp d theta plus, well, some constant that for reasons that are, uh, uh, will become clear in a second, I call L plus 1, uh, L times L plus 1, minus the effect of this, that is minus m square, right? Uh, this this remaining sine square theta. So times p, this must vanish. Okay, is that clear what I'm doing? Or I take this, I plug it into the equation. Now then I look. You see, uh, I have a, the only path, part that depends on phi is, is this. I call it b q. So it goes here. Then I assume that uh, this part gives a constant, so then I plug the constant in here. Everything that depends on theta is in here, right? With two constants that uh, I call L and M here. So this uh, is just a constant, but for reasons that will become clear in a second, I split, I, 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 I can split it in uh, L times L plus one. If you remember your quantum mechanics, you already know why that comes from. And uh, then, okay, I, if this is true and that is true, if, uh, that is true, then uh, for this equation to be satisfied, I also need that the second derivative of this function u of r, okay, with respect to r, minus this part, minus l, l plus one, 
divide by uh, r square, right, times u, also this must vanish. So these three are equivalent to this equation under the assumption that the solution can be separated in the product of three functions, each of one depending only on one variable. So that's the reason why a partial derivative becomes a total, a total derivative. Okay? But I'm sure you have already seen this in quantum mechanics, right? Uh, so we can go quickly. Why, why are you laughing? I mean, this is like uh, I mean, hundreds of times. The, the hydrogen atom uh, is solved in this way, right? And uh, they, they knew how to solve it because they have solved this uh, before. I mean, Schrodinger and company ha have solved the Laplace equations many times, so they knew what to do. I mean, that's the nice things about physics, that uh, many things uh, you can use in different contexts. I mean, after all, this is the Schrodinger equation. The time-independent Schrodinger equation is very similar, right? <coughs> so um, I can replace. So now I can study this, uh, this set of equations. And uh, uh, I can, in general, again, I mean, for instance, this one is, is rather simple, right? This looks like, a, looks what? Like a, the, the motion in the, in, the, in the gravitational field uh, of classical mechanics. Uh, uh, clearly, this, if I have a function, so let's put it here. If I have a function u of r that is just uh, like uh, some constant, a, Again, the constant is going to be determined by the boundary condition, but let's just discuss in general. It's just a function of, uh, of uh, positive powers of, of the ra radius or like this, right? Mm? What do you mean the other way? No, no. No, 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 I think. I think, uh, let, let's, let me try it this way. Uh, uh, and this should be a solution, right? Because that increases the power. Yeah, I think, uh, no, I think it's correct. Usually this, uh, uh, if you remember, um, so let me take this, then how about P? Now P, uh, 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 take, uh, uh, so P, P uh, depends on uh, uh, on on the variable theta, but usually it's written uh, uh, so usually uh, the cosine of this variable theta uh, is called x. Uh, again, uh, you you will save work in this class if you uh, uh, remember what you did for for um, uh, in quantum mechanics. Uh, and then this equation, right, simplifies in a way. This equation I'm talking. Uh, uh, if you ch do the change of variable, this uh, deri derivative of theta sine uh, becomes a dx of 1 minus x squared dp dx plus that uh, combination of L, L plus 1 minus m squared. One, th then you have the sine, that 1 minus the cosine squared, so 1 minus x squared p. So this P, the P, so okay, this is a differential equation. The, the, this one, I knew how to solve it. This one, I know how to solve it, but it's a little more complicated, and it's sufficiently complicated that it got the name. This is called the generalized Legendre equation, the same Legendre that we already met. And, uh, uh, and, uh, Do you remember how they how they go? Do, do you or you don't? Did you did you study this function or not? Yes. 
So, okay, so just tell me. I mean, why is called generalized? So what is generalized here? Is this guy here, right? Because usually this is studied in a simpler form where you take the, so if you take m equal to 0, this simplifies further to obviously just this term here, right? And uh, I don't know what is the name of this. Uh, I guess it's the Legendre equation, not the generalized. And this one has a solution, this uh, famous Legendre polynomial, that uh, you see they have a, an index L that uh, takes into account this, uh, this coefficient. And then they depend on the cosine of theta. So they are function of the cosine of theta that I call x. And then uh, they are uh, uh, identified by the particular value you give to this L. Okay? And they are just polynomial. So they are called the polynomial Legend. For instance, L equal to 0. Right? This is the simplest case. You don't, have, you don't even have this term. So what is the solution? Then you, you have a very simple e e e equation there because the P0 of x is equal to just, uh, it's just a constant in particular if you normalize that uh, with the usual rule, it's just 1. And P1, so if you take L equal to 1, so I don't know how... how, how L equal to 1, right? So you have that, you check, uh, it's just uh, x. And then you keep on going. P2x uh, uh, with the appropriate normalization always is 1 half 3x squared minus 1. And, and, and you can keep on going very long time because you have an infinite number of those things. Okay, so I assume that you are familiar then with this stuff, that you have used it many times in solving uh, problems, uh, I don't know, in quantum mechanics. On, on the but this is the place where, where they come uh, in. So you see, we, we have, uh, in a way, uh, uh, almost solved uh, this equation. We, we, so we have the Legend uh, polynomial that this one and they solve that stuff. But clearly, what are the property of this? Uh, uh, so th th you see, we, we are doing what we have done before with the sine and the hyperbolic function. We introduce a set of functions, and these functions uh, are what is, uh, say, a, it's a complete orthogonal set of functions, meaning that any other function can be built by a superposition of this set of functions, OK? So in particular, this part coefficient here they come from the orthonormal condition, OK? So I don't know how much uh, we want to. Uh, probably not much. Uh, So let's see an example. Now we are in spherical coordinates. So let's, let's stick to this uh, simplest case in which uh, m is equal to 0, I guess. So this is, uh, what, what is the symmetry here? You have a azimuthal symmetry, right? There is no dependence uh, on the azimuthal angle, right? So uh, your solution, so m is equal to 0. So the solution does not depend uh, on the phi angle. This, uh, this is azimuthal angle. So my potential uh, is just a function of r. And so m equal to 0. So I have this azimuthal symmetry. OK? It's like a, a spherical symmetry with no dependence on and therefore, I, I identify the elementary building blocks are this function and this. So this u function uh, and, uh, and the, the Legend polynomial. And then the generic function is going to be a superposition. So I sum over all possible values of this L. 
from 0 to infinity, OK, with some coefficients that are going to be determined again by the boundary conditions. Then I have this function here, a r l plus 1 plus b. Uh, of course, uh, uh, if I maybe it's better to write it like this. This two depends on a l, OK? And you sum over all the l. And then here you have your polynomial depending on the cosine of theta. So that's the generic solution. Let's fix uh, some boundary condition. Again, I'm, I'm doing the same I did before. For instance, I take uh, that phi, uh, uh, phi of r, so on a sphere of, of radius a, OK, is equal to some function. So I assume that uh, uh, I impose from outside that uh, I'm studying the problem inside the sphere. And on this sphere, this potential has, a, 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 well, it has spherical symmetry. So I'm, I'm sorry, it, doesn't, it, 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 it has the, a certain value at the fixed distance at the radius. And then it depends on theta according to this function. Okay, So I impose this boundary condition. So it's on a sphere. And then on this sphere, my potential has a value depending on this angle, theta. And there is no dependence on the, on the other one because I'm taking the, this m equal to 0, OK? So you see that for this two, now I, I can, I can uh, uh, determine the coefficients. But first of all, uh, I want this solution to be finite for r equal to 0 at the center, for instance, right? I don't want. So this term is not there. Therefore, I get uh, that uh, it must be a sum from L, to L equal to 0 to infinity or only this part here. So A, L, R, L plus 1, P, L, cosine of theta. And then uh, you do the, the same that we did. You integrate this. You multiply by the other polynomial, and you will get uh, the, the, co the coefficients that you want, OK? So you see, it works uh, the same way. How about um, so you can, uh, yeah. It does not depend on, on phi. No, it, it, well, it, it, the, this is the, mo the most general function in which uh, there is no dependence on, on phi. So in a second, I'm going to write the most general in which there is a dependence on, on, on phi. I just did this because it's simpler. But uh, in a second, I'm going to reintroduce the full function, the one that also depends on phi. It will add some uh, phi dependence. And uh, you already know that. Uh, when you also have that, this uh, Legendre polynomial become this, uh, 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 how it's called, hyper uh, hyperspherical, spherical, spherical harmonics, right? Uh, how, do you, how did you call them? Spherical harmonics, OK. So when, when, uh, when you reintroduce, well, OK, we, I'll, I'll do it in a second. First, I want to, <coughs> so then uh, you, you, you multiply both sides. So this thing must be must be equal to v, v of theta when r is equal to a. Then you multiply both sides by p l prime. You integrate, and you get the value of this coefficient, OK? Exactly as before. This is the generic uh, technique. Uh, so before we move to, so uh, let me give you two uh, exercises that, uh, two simple exercises uh, about this. Uh, uh, orthonormal functions. So homework 
next Monday. Uh, so show, show that. So two things. So first, I, I want, in a way, to rederive this uh, Legend polynomial. So how, how can you do that? So take the space of, uh, of function quadratically integrable in a certain interval. You need them to be integrable, so that the square is integral. So this space usually is called, I don't know, L2 in the interval from minus 1 and 1. So we, we take an interval. And, and you consider all the functions that have this property, OK? So first, uh, you should show that uh, the, the set of all polynomials, so x to the n, with n equal to 0, 1, and so on, so this the set of all polynomials uh, uh, is linearly independent with respect to the scalar product where the scalar product is the integration, as I did. So you introduce a scalar product here, two functions that are this polynomial, OK? You integrate in this interval, minus 1 plus 1, with the usual rule that, uh, OK, here they are real, but uh, you can define it. So you should show that they are linearly independent uh, with respect to this. Uh, linear independent and with respect to this. And then you apply the Schmidt, you know the Schmidt orthonormalization procedure? You do. Otherwise, you go on uh, Wikipedia. Uh, and so verify that this set of polynomial uh, satisfy this. Very simple. Then you apply this Schmidt uh, orthonormalization procedure, uh, and you write uh, this po the, the first few. And you will uh, recover, essentially, the the Legendre polynomial, OK? I mean, very simple. And then uh, you can do the same uh, with the function. Instead of polynomial, consider uh, the function I e to the i m phi, where m uh, uh, takes value uh, positive and negative. So it, it's uh, z, I guess, is called that uh, minus plus uh, number. And again, that they form an orthogonal set. Uh, now, what is the space? Is L2, again, uh, from 0 and 2 pi. So again, quadratically integrable, but now not from minus 1 and plus 1, but from 0 to 2 pi, obviously. And uh, then uh, check if they are normalized. Are they? properly normalized? The answer is no. So you should find uh, what, uh, what is the coefficient here. You should multiply this function to have them orthonormal, normalized to 1. Very simple. Right? Uh, yeah. But just do it for the, for the heck of it. OK, so this just to. Now, of course, in, in a traditional class of electromagnetism, then uh, you know you spend two weeks on this uh, on this uh, uh, Laplace equations, but we, we don't have time. And it also, uh, and uh, as as you told me, you already sort of did some of these exercises in solving the the Schrödinger equation or whatever. So uh, the only thing that is left uh, that uh, indeed we need. Uh, uh, is uh, uh, what is the g so I, I, I we discussed this Legendre polynomial. What happened when m is different from zero? So when uh, your uh, your problem your function uh, does indeed depend on phi, the third uh, variable. Okay, so uh, uh, let me just state the result. Then you have to solve the full set of three equations. You have to plug in back the third equation that we sort of forgot. But that equation that, unfortunately, I erased, the one for q, was very simple, yeah, because it was, again, an exponential, like before. Yes? The? Uh, you're talking about the, the homework or? The homework. No, you just, I, I define the function, e to the i phi, 
uh, the product is like before. You take the integral from 0 to pi of this. So compute that integral and verify that you should get 1 or 0, right? You are not going to get 1 or 0. You are going to get the number, so you have to divide by the square of the number. Then uh, you, you get that indeed they give you the delta, the Kronecker symbol, right? That is the definition of orthonormal. Okay. So let me just... Uh, so the, the Legend polynomial uh, now uh, that uh, we use, they, they, they were just a function of x, uh, and then uh, depending on the value of L, the constant, you, 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 you had a different combination of this polynomial. But now they, they also depend on M because of that uh, things. And uh, 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 when you plug in the proper normalization again, so is going to have a polynomial that is going to depend on L, but also of M, like it was here. Unfortunately, I, uh, so, so you remember, right? There was a term. Should I rewrite it? Or what well, you have it in your, uh, so it's not going to depend on only on L, but there is also a, a part that is uh, M squared divided by, you remember? So this is a solution of D, DX. 1 minus x squared dp dx plus, before it was just l plus l times l plus 1, but now you also have this m squared divided by 1 minus x squared. So this is p um, l m of x equal to 0, p l m x. So these functions here are solution of this more complicated equation. And also, you are going to have the piece that comes from the big Q. So you are going to multiply this by e to the i, uh, I call it uh, m phi. So that's the set uh, of function. And when you check for the fact, uh, as you will check uh, uh, in your exercise, for those to be well, they are orthogonal, but to be normal, uh, you have to multiply by the square root of 2L plus 1 divided by 4 pi, uh, 2L plus 1, and then L minus M factorial, L plus M factorial. But this is just uh, from uh, the normality. And this combination, so this properly normalized uh, product of exponential and generalized uh, like Le Le Legend polynomial is called y, l m theta phi, and I guess these are the spherical harmonics that you already know. But this way, I mean, this is the way they they came about. <coughs> And if you go and check uh, the, the first few, so for instance, if you take L equal to 0 and M equal to 0, then uh, this is, a, again, it's, very, it's just a constant. And if you plug in the proper normalization, you get that this constant is, as before, the 1 over the square root of 4 pi. That is just the normalization of this. But then uh, you can uh, keep on going. The 1, 1 is, I guess, in this 3 a pi sine theta e to the i phi. Y, 1, 0, 3 over 4 pi, the cosine of theta. And then, uh, you know, in a, you can keep on going and you get all of them. Or you, s you, you find them in, in, in many books. So... Why are they useful? Because now I can write the generic solution. So the generic potential solution of the Neumann equation in spherical coordinate, right? So it's r, theta, and phi is a big superposition of all these functions, right? So you have uh, uh, L that goes from 0 to infinity. Then M, if you remember, can only go from minus L to plus L, right? 
And then you have the, the, the part that depends on R that uh, uh, I wrote and then erased. Y you remember it was A. Now this, co this constant depends on L and M. R, L plus B, L, M, uh, R minus L plus 1. Now probably you are happier because this is the, I, I pull it out, this R. And uh, Y, L, M theta phi. So this, this bunch of stuff that is there, I, I gave it another name. I call it the spherical harmonic. And so this is the generic solution in spherical coordinates. And then for a given boundary condition, you are going to fix uh, these coefficients again. So again, I'm not sure we really want to So again, uh, well, I didn't know whether to assign a lot of homeworks on this or not. And I guess I decided not because, uh, well, I don't know why. <laughs> but uh, if you feel that you need exercise on this, you can go on the textbooks. And you, at the end of the chapter, electro electrostatics, you have just but exercise of this, I mean, of course. But uh, it's nice, and uh, that's the origin of these special functions, and, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. Of course, the, the easiest application of this is you go inside the sphere, as before, right? You assign the value of the potential on, on some, um, for instance, the, in all textbooks, there is this problem in which uh, you have two halves, two halves of a sphere, a different value of the potential. And then you have to solve it. So I encourage, we, we are not going to do that, but uh, if you, you know, I mean, the weekend is supposed to be, again, very cold. If you thought that it was over, it's not over. <laughs> you, you need to survive one more weekend. And so you can try this, but uh, okay. it's in all books and also you find easily the solution. So. But uh, so why I went through all this if I'm not going to assign homeworks on this? Well, because I do need this in order to do this famous multiple expansion. That is what I want to do if I Let's try to do it before so that we finish with the electrostatic stuff. And then on Friday, we move to magnetostatics. Uh, if you thought that electrostatics is boring, <laughs> wait for the <laughs> magnetostatic part. <laughs> I mean, things get interesting only when time comes back. But uh, unfortunately, you have to know these things. So. But you see, it picks up as soon as we come back to the full Maxwell equation. Because then all the fun comes in. Radiation, you know, moving, moving uh, uh, waves, and also relativity, of course. So we, at that point, we will stop, and we will spend one week to to discuss together uh, about uh, Einstein theory, I mean, because it really comes in here. I mean, after all, the paper by Einstein was called on the electrodynamics of moving, of, 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 mooning, of moving conducting bodies, something like this. That is really a, a bad title <laughs> to give to such an important paper, but really he was wondering about Maxwell equations. But before we get there, uh, let's, uh, okay, just bear with me and, and, and let's do this. That is really, this is really important. I already sort of uh, expansion, I already mentioned it several times. Uh, so let's do it uh, uh, properly, uh, uh, properly. So uh, again, we, we write the generic, uh, uh, so we have uh, some localized charge distribution. So we come back to physics now. We have some localized charge distribution, right? Function uh, somewhere. 
and we, we, we don't go inside. In fact, we step outside at a certain distance, and outside this charge distribution, uh, I can write my, my potential. So outside this charge distribution, the potential satisfy a plus equation, right? Because Poisson equation is inside where you have uh, some rho different from zero. But we, we are here somewhere. So outside this charge distribution, uh, and so uh, uh, I can write again uh, uh, this uh, uh, expansion. So let me write it, uh, so I normalize it uh, uh, in this form now. Um, so I put this famous 4 pi epsilon naught uh, because I want to, so I, I can always multiply a constant in front of what I wrote before, and I multiply this because uh, when I solve the Poisson equation, I know that the potential is going to get this. Then I had this sum uh, for L from zero to infinity, right? And then M that goes from minus L plus L. Then I had that some constant that now I pick to be this. Okay, so I'm, um, then I have some coefficient. Now you remember I had the part going like r and the part going like uh, 1 over r. And now I'm studying this potential of a finite charge distribution. So it's a reasonable boundary condition at the infinity that you have zero potential, right? Because, I mean, it's a finite distribution. If I go far away, it, it's like uh, it shouldn't be there. So I only pick, uh, so I take some, some uh, coefficient that uh, I call b before but now I call Q because uh, this is the, is, uh, uh, is the uh, standard notation for the, these are going to be the, 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 the coefficient in the multiple expansion. These are going to be the multiples. Uh, so let me call it now Q, what I call B before. Uh, and then I had this Y, uh, LM, this uh, spherical harmonics, right? And I, I, I'm taking only the part that goes like R L plus one. So the other one, I throw it away by using the boundary condition, okay? So instead of having two sets of coefficient, the fact that I impose the potential to vanish uh, uh, like one of, of, of some, uh, you know, like at least like uh, R, one over R, uh, uh, half, uh, half the number, half the number of coefficient, okay? So this is a slightly, th this co numbers here are slightly different as before, I guess, because uh, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 sh I'm shifting, okay, I'm shifting some of this, uh, okay. <coughs> now, if you compare, on, on the other hand, uh, I know the solution of this problem is what we did uh, I guess, uh, uh, on Friday, because I know that the potential, so this, this, is, a, this is R prime, uh, uh, this is R prime and this is R. So R prime is, uh, okay, so in an in arbitrary point R outside, I know the potential for this uh, charge distribution because this is just four pi e epsilon naught, uh, the, uh, the integral of uh, the charge distribution R minus R prime integrated over the R prime volume. So this is R prime volume. And uh, just by Coulomb, uh, uh, is what we did on, on, uh, on Friday, if I remember correctly. Uh, by using Gauss law, uh, that is the same than uh, essentially the Coulomb uh, uh, force, uh, I know the potential for that, okay? So uh, <coughs> I can uh, try to map these two solutions and fix these coefficients, right? This is what I want to do. And uh, you see that uh, uh, to, uh, what, what is the, the relation between these two is the fact that uh, if you look at this function, r minus r prime, right? This is again is a function that can be described by a superposition of this uh, uh, spherical coordinate, right? In fact, this function 
is exactly 4 pi, the sum from L to 0 uh, to infinity of L minus M to M, or 1 over 2L plus 1, then uh, you have these things uh, uh, depending on which one is larger. So usually it's like R prime L, R L plus 1, assuming that R is larger than R prime. And then you have a product of this, uh, uh, a product of, uh, of, the, uh, of the spherical harmonics, right? I mean, the spherical harmonics are a, are a, a complete uh, orthonormal set, so you can expand any function on that basis, and uh, so I guess this is the result. So this potential here that we derive from Gauss law, now I can plug in this expansion in uh, har spherical harmonics inside the integral, and I get uh, 1 over f naught, uh, the 4 pi simplify this 4 pi, and then I get this sum over L uh, and M, I mean this double sum, 1 over 2L plus 1. Then I get, uh, you see, I have to do the integral. I mean, this is the integral over volume. Here I have the dependence of the angular variables, and here I have the dependence on the radii. So here I get uh, a, an integral of this spherical harmonic Lm of theta prime phi prime, right? So primes are variables describing the, 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 the position inside the volume. No, I'm prime is just, uh, okay? So here I have to keep this, uh, uh, this uh, R prime L, and that multiplies the charge density R prime, okay? This is the integral over R prime. So these were the prime, and these are prime. So this was theta prime, phi prime. This is theta and phi. These theta and phi are the angles of the position of R, not of R prime that I'm integrating over. So you can pull those outside the integral, and you get this Y Lm of theta phi divided by this R that is not integrated over because is telling me where I am in space outside the, the charge distribution, okay? So you see that the, now the potential is nicely written in terms of, the, of the, the part that depends uh, only on your position in space uh, where you are, and then uh, this part here that is the one that you are supposed to integrate over. But you see, these are just numbers, right? Once I give you this function here, this is an integral, so there is no residual dependence on this variable. So these I call QLM. Uh, these are this QLM, you see? Right? So I have computed this QLM that were the coefficients of this generic expansion by using uh, the solution that I knew from Coulomb's force law uh, for the field, for the potential outside the charge distribution. Okay? So this, is this clear or? It's very simple. I mean, you see, you just, you just exploit, you just expand 1 over R in spherical harmonics and then you plug in, and then uh, you see everything that is not a function of the prime variables can be pulled out, and then uh, you get exactly the same term here and here, uh, you see, because this goes away, so you have 1 over epsilon, 2L. You have this double sum over L and M, that is this. So this must be QLM. This QLM that once you give me this charge distribution, I can just compute for you, are going to be numbers, right, depending on the charge inside, and they are called uh, uh, the, the, the monopoles, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the multiple expansion, uh, the coefficient of the multiple expansion, because now you can see that, for instance, let's, for instance, let's take the Q0, 0, 
the lowest uh, coefficient. That is just uh, the, uh, the uh, you see, L, you take L equal to 0, then automatically, if L is equal to 0, you know that uh, you cannot have dependence on, uh, this is the, the spherical situation, so M is equal to 0, so this is the Q0,0. Zero, zero. So you can see that if, if Y0,0, zero, zero, I wrote it there before, right? So you get that this is just 1 over, you remember Y0,0, zero, zero, one, 1 over the square root of 4 pi, you pull it out, then uh, this is 0, so it's not there. So you only have the integral over the charge distribution left. But what is this integral? The so this is just the charge divided by 4 pi. This is called the monopole, obviously. So the lowest coefficient in this multipole expansion that corresponds to taking the uh, L equal to 0 is called the monopole. And you see it's just the total charge inside this volume. So if you have some charge, you go very far away. In fact, uh, you don't see, at that point, you don't even see the shape of this charge distribution. But what you see is just uh, a field. This is the leading term, you see. It's leading term because, you see, it's not suppressed by powers of, uh, uh, of that. Uh, uh, what you see is just the total charge of this object. You don't resolve the structure. Maybe it's, it's complicated. You know, you have some charge here, some other charge here but uh, you only see the total charge, and this is the leading term. Now, if the total charge of this charge distribution happened to be zero, then uh, you have zero, right? For instance, if you, well, okay. But, however, you may also have situation in which the total charge, for, for instance, the, the dipole, uh, the dipole, um, uh, things that we study uh, on Monday, right? That, uh, if you look from far away, I, 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 what is the total charge of the dipole? It's zero. So it has no monopole term. So I, actually, you don't see this term from far away, right? So you have to move to the next term in this expansion. The, mon the dipole is there, but it's not in the monopole. In fact, it's the next term. The dipole is the next term that is when I take uh, Q well, actually, it's, 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 it's a, you, you take L equal to 1. So this was L. If you take L equal to 1, this is called the dipole term. It's the next term in this expansion, right? And you see, it, it, now, because L is equal to 1, you actually have two possibilities, right? You can have the Q, uh, uh, okay, 1, 1, right? You take L equal 1, uh, also M equal to 1. Or you can take L equal to 1 and M equal to 0. So you have two terms, the Q11 one one and the Q10. <coughs> Again, you plug the, 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 the explicit expression for the spherical harmonics in here. And you see that the Q11 one one is minus. So you get that coefficient that I wrote before. That, uh, and then uh, you have the integral, but the integral now, you see, you have uh, uh, see, now you have L equal to 1. Okay. So now you have to be careful uh, about the direction. So let me put it, uh, I put here the result. So you have X prime minus 1, Y prime rho of r prime d3r. And the one q10 one is 3, 4 pi. Now, this is the one that only has the z. Maybe you verify that, I mean, as an exercise. 
So uh, you understand you have to take the function here now. I here you have a function that depends on the, on the coordinate. And uh, when you do this integral, you will see that if you take the 1, 1, you have the x, y directions. And in the other case, you get the z direction. Actually, these are combination. If you remember how we define the, the if you define p, you may remember the dipole moment to be the integral over r prime, rho r prime d3 d over the volume, right? Because this was, a, well, we define it for single charges, right? But uh, you understand this is the generalization for a, a, a continuous distribution of charge. Then uh, you see that uh, this, this term up here is minus 3 over uh, <coughs> 8 pi is just the px minus the py, right? And this one here is just 3 over 4 pi square root of uh, the pz. So indeed, uh, these coefficients are what we call before the, the dipole moment. And you keep, you, you can keep on going, but, yeah, you, they, when it's one, it can be, uh, yes, but that uh, is, is in the Q11, right, because you, you can check, check uh, that this is correct. You get two coefficients. I mean, the the this is just QLM, so you you get the the, the one M then can be up to one, so you get zero and one. Here you sum, but here you just have the L and M. But check that uh, you get this. Uh, when you plug in, you get the, the type of model. So what is the next term in this expansion? Uh, uh, yes. Well, Q11, I wrote it here. This is the physical interpretation. These are the component components of the electric dipole moment in the x, y direction. And this is the component in the z direction. So, uh, for instance, if you had these two charges as we discussed on Friday, uh, you get uh, zero for the monopole, but of course the L equal one dipole moment is different from zero, and uh, you get uh, the result that, uh, in fact, if you plug them back here, you get exactly the potential that we compute together. You see, because here you get the, this p vector, and then essentially here you have, uh, you know, is the L equal 1, so you have the R square, and then here you get some cosine, of, uh, as we did before. So indeed, we are, we are recovering in a systematic manner what we did for a, a special example. So since we are uh, 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 we, we can, of course, we can keep on going for forever, but uh, usually people stop uh, at the, well, this is the, uh, at the next, the next that is L, e so we did L equal to zero, L equal one, so the next one is a L equal to two, this is called the quadrupole, quadrupole terms, because there is more, there are more than one, in fact, how many you have? Uh, so now uh, we have uh, L equal to 2. M can go from 0 to 2. So we have Q2, 0, Q2, 1, and Q2, 2. So let me just write here these terms. Uh, <coughs> and uh, if you want, uh, you can verify that this is the case by using this. Uh, you have to put here, for instance, Y to two, the complete expression, then do the integral, and you will see that you get that the Q22 is with the correct uh, coefficients, something like, you, here you get the, an integral like, uh, like before, 
but square, and then uh, whatever your charge distribution is, you get this. And uh, the Q to 1 is minus this 15 to 8 pi. Then this has to do with the z direction multiplied by. So you see, this, this is like a square or a dipole because. Uh, And finally, the Q to 0 is 1 half phi divided by 4 pi square root. This has to do with the, with the z direction, uh, and it should be something like this. Actually, now la, let me now erase this. All these terms can be. Uh, you know, as here I collect this using the, the dipole vector, dipole moment. Here I can collect this by introducing a, a quadrupole moment tensor that usually is indicated by BQ, okay? It's a, it's a QIJ equal, we already met this in classical mechanics. That was the, uh, yeah. So you see, use, useful concept always return, or maybe it's the other way around that we tend to use whatever we have found over and over. So if you introduce this, that is the quadruple, what? So it has nothing to do with it. No, no, no. You said something, but... Okay. D'accord. I want to... I'm asking this. Okay. What do you think is classical mechanics? Why? Do you think in classical mechanics what we can do? We can compute. How we can compute? But you remember. You, you, you were here. No. <laughs> you forget. Okay. But this was the, the momentum of inertia, right? Well, you see, th this is nice. This, this is a this is a tensor that quantifies some distribution, right? And you see, before here you had the density of mass, and that was quantify how the mass was distributed. Now you have a charge density, so this is quantify how the charges are distributed. So the idea is not very different. And uh, if you introduce this, then you can write this uh, this coefficient. As, as I did here, right, as combination of the dipole moment, those are combination of the quadrupole uh, moment components, and it's a little bit complicated, but let me just write it here. So you see here you have the Q. This, this could be a nice exercise, but, uh, I mean, it's <laughs> you can do it, but we are not going to do it together because it's kind of boring. And this, so I put here the, the, the result, and then you can check it on your own time. So you see, these three quadrupole terms can be written as particular combination of the quadrupole moment tensor. That, uh, that uh, then uh, if, if I give you a particular distrib charge distribution, as I'm going to give you for the exercise, then you plug that in, you compute these numbers, and you get these other numbers, and then you know the solution, okay? <coughs> so if you write now the monopole in terms of the total charge, the dipole in terms of the dipole moment, and the quadrupole terms in terms of the quadrupole moment tensor, then the potential that we wrote before can be written as 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Then that integral can be expanded according to this expansion. And the first three terms, according to this notation, are going to be Q over R plus P dot X, the position at which you are R cubed, plus one-half the sum over ij of qij, this tensor, xi, xj, r to the fifth, plus higher multiple terms that we are not going to discuss. So you see how beautiful this is. 
you take an arbitrary charge distribution made uh, like this, and you step aside here at the point R, here, okay, identified by the vector x, and uh, the potential is given by this infinite sum, but you see, if you are far enough, uh, then you can stop at the first three terms because the next term is going to be even smaller than r to the fifth. So the, the leading term is this, then there is a correction, then there is a correction, but they go to zero rather quickly as you go f far away from the object. And you see, so you have the monopole that tells you what is the total charge in here, but you don't know how this charge is distributed. Then by looking at the next term, you start see if you have a, a dipole moment, roughly is, is telling you what, how much plus charge and minus charge are here and there. And then the quadrupole is really telling more detail how this charge is distributed and so on and so forth. You learn more and more as you resolve more and more of these terms. In most cases, the first two may, may be sufficient, but you understand that say you have a charge distribution that uh, has total charge zero, then this is gone. Say a neutral object, but it's not, is, is neutral, but it has a little bit of charge here, a little bit of charge there, right? But maybe this charge uh, is not plus minus, so it has no dipole moment. It's just, uh, you know, it's distributed in such a way that also the dipole moment is zero. Then uh, the first term you see is the quadrupole and so on and so forth. So let me just uh, do uh, So let me just uh, uh, yeah uh, give you uh, uh, homework on this so now you have all this beautiful formalism and the only thing you need to know is the charge distribution so I give you the, the, the simplest charge. So th here's an exe exercise. So, so let's assume that, uh, I mean, this and this, we saw it in, in detail, right? Because we compute, well, this is just Coulomb. And then on, on Friday, we computed this. If you have two charges, point charges, plus and minus, then you get this term, right? How about this term? So take this charge distribution. So you have like two dipoles. So this is Z, this is Y, and this is X. And you have one positive charge plus E here, one negative charge uh, here. L let's put it all uh, at A distance. And then you have another dipole moment, but in, in the direction X with a plus E and minus E, still at the distance A, okay? So you have four charges distributed like this. So what is the charge distribution of this charge distribution? What is the charge density of this charge distribution? Well, we can use uh, uh, our friend, the, the, the Dirac function. So you see they are in, uh, in the xy plane, so you have a delta z, right? So it, it, it's zero outside the plane identified by z equal to zero. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you have these charges. So you have uh, one charge in what? In dx, delta x that multiplies, so I guess I should, uh, dy minus a plus uh, the other charge in, right? So these two are these two charges here. And then you have two more charges that are uh, wh where y is equal to zero, and then you have x minus a plus bx uh, plus a, right? So this, this is the charge density of four charges like this. So then I'm asking, okay, the dipole moment is trivial, so my, my, the exercise is compute the, the component of the, uh, the, of the quadrupole, the tensor, okay? So compute q11, q22, and all the others.
and that we solve on Monday. So that's a nice uh, application of, uh, I mean, this is the simplest application of this. And uh, let me do one last thing, and then uh, I let you go. Uh, so this was the exercise. Uh, uh, you understand that with this expansion, uh, you remember that we wrote the energy for a charge distribution. The energy for a charge distribution is the charge distribution times the potential, right, uh, integrated over the volume. Okay, so, so you have a charge distribution. You want to compute this, uh, the energy of this charge distribution in the potential or in external field of some other charge distribution. So you take the potential generated by this other charge distribution, you multiply by this, and you integrate. This is the potential energy. I think I, I, I did, did I do that or not? I think I did. <coughs> did I or not? Okay, well, if I didn't, no, I did, I think. Yes, I did. <laughs> I even show that there is, propo you can show that this is uh, like, is the, the square of the electric field, no? Did I do that or not? Yes? Somewhere, some. Well, if I didn't, then, uh, okay, that's it. This is the energy of, uh, I, and the only thing I wanted to, to, to say is that uh, uh, now this potential, right, uh, I, I can do the same sort of, uh, of, of Taylor expansion. Uh, uh, that is, this is a potential uh, in zero plus R prime dot the gradient of the potential in zero, right, plus one half the sum over ij from, say, 1 and 3 of xi, xj, 1 and 3 because I have 3 x, y, and z, d2, dxi, dxj of phi computed in 0, and so on and so forth. So I'm doing the Taylor series for this potential. You see, it's like a, the, uh, it's the reciprocal of what we did there, in a way, and then I can see that the potential the energy, uh, you see, I, I first you have the first term. Now, this is the potential, but it's just a constant, so I can pull it out. And what is left here is, again, the total charge. So I have the total charge times the potential at the center of this uh, distribution. Then uh, I have the second term. You see, the second term, again, I can pull it out, and what I'm left here Right, I mean, th this thing here, you understand, this is minus the, uh, the electric field in that point, right? So that is some value that I can pull out. And what is left inside is now R prime phi, right, uh, uh, sorry, R prime, the charge distribution, that again is what I call here the dipole, the dipole moment. So the next term is the dipole moment times the E field in zero. And if I do the same there, I get this minus one sixth because of the Q I J D A J D X I computed in zero plus the other terms. Okay? So I take this, I plug in inside, whatever these derivatives start acting on the charge density, generating components of the of the quadrupole tensors, and uh, if you put everything together, you get this term. So you see the, pot the energy of a charge distribution in an external electric field is given again by sort of a monopole term, that is the total charge of that times the potential, sort of the average potential, that is the potential in a, in a, in a given point. The next correction is a sort of the dipole of that charge distribution times the field. And if you keep going, you get, uh, you see, the quadrupole times derivatives of the electric field. So also the potential, say, if you ask what is the energy of some weird charge distribution in some electric external electric field, 
then again, you can do the same expansion and you have a, a leading term that is the total charge by the average potential. Then uh, you have terms, if you have a dipole moment, you have extra term and they are proportionally to the derivative of the potential, so to the electric field. And the quadrupole is proportional to the de second derivative of the potential, that is the derivative of the electric field. So, okay, so if the electric field is constant, this gives zero, okay? Like uh, if the electric field, that is if the potential is constant, this gives zero, and you only have this term. Okay.